I used to do a lot of things the hard way. Back as a young man studying jazz guitar in college, I developed a rather unhealthy or, you say, counterproductive obsession with alternate picking. You know, digga 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 digga. My heroes, you know, um, Aldi Miola, John McLaughlin, Steve Morse, guys like that, could do that. And that really fascinated me, got me very excited. And a lot of jazz players, uh, like George Benson, Pat Martino, could do that. And I, I assumed that they could just play anything they wanted to. So with that um, understanding or misunderstanding, I set out to try to practice everything I knew, every single conceivable scale that I learned, every arpeggio, in all 12 keys, starting down, up, down, up, alternate picking, and run through everything. And then I'd start again, starting on upstroke. I mean, it was crazy. I was training like an Olympic athlete, you know, seven days a week, just get up in the morning, cup of coffee, shower, just start practicing in my dorm room or in a music building practice room or something. And a lot of this time spent in the prime of my life, you know, away from my friends, my girlfriend, and being outside and stuff, was kind of a big waste of time, unfortunately. I mean, it, I did learn the neck. I learned notes. I learned, you know, scale shapes and arpeggio patterns and everything. But in terms of the technical goal of achieving that kind of picking fluidity, it didn't really happen. It was kind of disappointing. Um, instead, I just became chronically sore. You know, like a, an athlete who overtrains, you know, you kind of like lose some of your chops. It was weird. And even worse than that was my feel, you know, like my touch, which I had been so proud of as an unschooled, hard rocking teenager, kind of became kind of stilted and stiff sounding because I was just practicing everything tick, tick, digga, 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 with a metronome, you know, at a moderately fast tempo, say between 110, 120 beats per minute, you know, with the hope that one day I would just wake up and just be able to just or rip through everything like a chainsaw. But that, like I said, it never really happened. I became sore and just kind of achy. And I go to jam with people and I was like, it felt kind of stiff. And I would even turn the time around sometimes. Like, you know, the downbeats become the upbeats. Drummers would be like, Whoa, what's up with this guy, it's time. So, I mean, that was kind of maddening, you know? I was doing all this training um, and wasn't really getting anywhere. So I eventually came to the conclusion that I was, what I was doing was I was training myself to be a beast of burden you know, trying to conquer the most difficult patterns on a guitar with the, you know, expectation that I would just be able to just break loose and do that. And that's what you had to do it. You just had to muscle through it. And I realized eventually that, you know, that actually the, the trick, as it were, the key is to try to go around these obstacles, find an easier way, like a different, take advantage of the different openings that are available on a guitar. You know, things that sound cool, sound impressive, but are like delightfully easy, easier to play. You know, so it's not so much a question of plowing through the obstacle or the mountain, but if you can find a way to go around it, you know, be like water, find the finest little cracks, you know, like a river, like finding its way to the ocean it takes a circuitous route sometimes. But as long as you get the sound you want, okay? So with that in mind, I'd like to show you some cheats, as they would say in the gaming world, or, um, you know, shortcuts that make things a little easier to alternate pick. Not necessarily easy, but easier. You know, I, I've made some interesting observations and I've discovered that a lot of it has to do with crossing strings. You know, like tremolo picking on one string is fairly easy. You're playing up and down one string. But when you go to cross strings, that's when it gets weird. So with that in mind, let's get started with a simple little note pattern. And I'll show you a hard way, arduous way, and then a couple easier ways. And we'll take it from there. Okay, take this pattern. <laughs> That's the first eight, or one, two, three, four, five, the first five notes of a C major scale played as 16th notes, so it's like an eight note pattern. Now, I'm using a rather compact fretboard shape, which you'd think would be the way to go, right? You always go for a compact play in position, but if you look at the pick, it has to cross strings three times across the D, G, and B strings. So I'm going cross, cross, cross. So that's kind of hard to get faster in a certain point without sounding like you're struggling too much. And even if you try starting on upstroke, that's even weirder, right? You start missing notes. So I figured, why not try to consolidate the notes on fewer strings? So just play the same notes on two strings, the G and B. So I'm going to move the C note here over to here. So now I'm going to go. And that's a lot easier because you only have to cross from here. That's the one cross, and I'm using what's called outside the strings picking, 
which you may have heard me use that term before in other lessons. It's when you have two adjacent strings, or I guess it could be a string skip as well, and you're picking a downstroke and then going to a higher string at, on an upstroke, or doing an upstroke and a higher string, and then a downstroke and a lower string. The point is the uh, pick is being sent in the direction that it wants to go. You know, you're not changing direction in midair, fighting inertia. So by doing that, it makes it a lot easier to pick. Right, you start on the top note. I've maximized, optimized the technique there, so... So, even though it's a little bit more of a stretch here at the front hand, it's not too bad. And here's another way you could play it. You can finger the notes here and start on an upstroke. Now I'm going up, down. So I'm still doing outside the strings picking, which is the opposite of inside the strings picking. That's when you're going to go a lot more movement. In either case, you do have to, the pick obviously has to change direction, right? In mid air. I mean, if you're just picking on one string, you're changing direction. That's the easiest thing to do because there's minimal movement involved minimal distance and uh, that cuts down in your travel time, right? You look at it that way in terms of physics. So, sounds less strained, it's easier to do. So, that is a good example. Now, let me show you a longer example. This one is an A harmonic minor scale. Say so you're going to play this run here. It's like a neoclassical type of thing. That's uh, rather arduous, the alternate pick. You know, I mean, you could throw in um, some pull-offs, maybe do a little sweep in there, but you're not going to get that same kind of sound, that digga 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 digga, which is, if that's your goal. So why do that when you could alternatively go... So what I did was I'm playing it on one string using finger slides with the index finger. Shift, shift. Shift, 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 shift. And the timbre, the tone, is more consistent too, right? And to a non-guitar player, that sounds, oh, it sounds like a guy's got chops, you know? And it's like, wow, he's a virtuoso, even though you're cheating, right? But only other guitar players would know that. So, and it looks cooler on stage, right? Flying up and down, that cascading up and down one string. So that's another example of just trying to consolidate as many notes in the one string as possible. Okay, now let's look at your conventional major scale fingering. Say for a G major scale in third position, it's actually fourth position because your middle finger is at the fifth fret and the position is really determined by the finger behind your middle finger. So if I use this standard fingering, Nice and neat for the fret hand, right? I mean, it's great for hammering on. If you want to do that, get a legato approach, totally cool. That's just as musically valid and legitimate as picking. But it becomes a problem, like I said, most guitar players don't even realize that when they cross strings, sometimes they're doing the inside the strings picking move. And here, if you go, start on a downstroke, you're going to go down, up, down, up. That's cool. That's outside the strings picking. But then when you do your next string cross, you're going down, up, down, up, down, up, down. You're going to encounter an inside the strings right there. That's going to slow you down a little bit in so much as it's going to make it a little more difficult. You got to put a little more effort into it. It's not too bad going up. When I say going up, I mean musically, you know, ascending. But because you're going down to the floor, even though I mentioned that Inside the strings picking, you have to overcome that inertia. You know, change in direction and then going over the string you just picked to the other one. You are getting an assist from gravity. Think about it. Gravity is always relentlessly pulling your hand down towards the floor. So... Now, coming down, descending, which you're actually going up, right? You're fighting gravity, so you're going... That's where you get hung up. 
Ugh. No fun, right? So why do that when you could alternatively use a descending fingering pattern coming down to go... So this way, every time I cross strings, I'm going down, up, right? You want to go on an upstroke when you're going this way, right? So I did two notes, down, up, down, up. Now four notes with a slide. Down, up, down, up. And then two notes, and then four notes with a finger slide again. So going up, I'm going to basically stick to the original fingering with a slight alteration. I move the G note from here over to here to set me up for this thing, so. That sounds a lot more even. It feels more relaxed, and just as importantly, it sounds less strained and more relaxed to the listener, right? You want to get that rigorous classical type of, you know, you hear like concert pianist, you know, that classical precision. So that's one way of doing it. If you really want to optimize every single string cross, including the ascending ones, you could use some finger slides and go diagonally this way. So if you're going to play a G major scale, you could do this. So what I did there is I did three notes. Because that actually, you know, down, up, down, sends you, the downstroke sends you to the A string, right? But now I'm going to go up, down, up, down, and play an extra note on the A string via the pinky slide. And then I did uh, either two notes or four notes on the remaining strings. And I got up to the same B note without even going to the high E string. So it's... And you want to take that to an extreme. You could make it in three octaves by just using four notes on each of the middle strings. This is kind of like a Steve Howe type of thing where you're going to fly way up and down the neck. That's actually enjoyable to do because you're not working too hard. You still got to work, right? There's no free lunch here with the guitar playing. But you look at the range. You got up to there, I think. Every single string cross is performed with outside the strings picking, which makes it easier on you. Now, the downside, the only downside of that is that you do hear an audible squeak when you shift, right? You know, depending on how new your strings are, a fresh set of strings will squeak more than a broken in set of strings, right? You could maybe use flat wound strings, as Pat Metheny had done in time, but most people, myself included, prefer the, the brighter sound of round wound strings, you know, better for rock, right? I mean, if you're just playing straight up jazz, uh, yeah, flat wounds will get rid of the slide, but they're not really appropriate for playing other styles of music. So, um, and the faster you go, the less noticeable they are, you know, this little finger slides. Now, what's interesting about this last pattern is I took the same fretboard path going up, going down as I did on the way up, but the finger slides were different. I slid up with the pinky. <laughs> But then coming down, I'm going to slide with the index finger. So those are shift slides. Actually, I think I played seven notes in the top string. I call that the turnaround, you know, like a, a swimmer kicking off the side of the pool that's turning around. But here, I just grouped a bunch of notes. As long as you go on an upstroke when you cross to the next lower string. You can take it in stages. Start out like, you know, get your motor running, so to speak. Or just practice it in isolation. Go. Try to stay relaxed. And palm the lower strings because you never want them ringing in the background. It just sounds like junk. It sounds like 
you know, sloppy to have the strings ringing. So even if you're not palm muting on the top strings, just palm mute them on the lower ones that you're not playing on. Now these four notes per string patterns are kind of out of necessity because if you were to just try to do two notes per string, you know, for the goal of avoiding uh, the squeaking of the shifts, you would kind of run out of notes because it takes your hand this way if you go. See, I was only able to go up to that note. If I started up here, that can be a little weird because you have to shift every second, every other note, right? So it's too much shifting. Those two notes per string patterns actually are ideally suited for pentatonic licks. Um, I like to call these picking cells, these four note patterns. Like say A minor pentatonic, you take these. That's a part of this box, the top part. And then you can shift to other adjacent boxes. You can go. That's kind of fun to do. I mean, a hell of a lot easier than going. That's not worth the effort, you know, but, but just by going, you know, and so I, I did this. I went four notes, shift. So I used, you know, the three adjacent boxes. You got this one. This one, and this one, and just picked whatever four note cells were the most convenient for my fret hand to get to in a hurry. And here our grand finale example is kind of like a roller coaster ascending run. This is based on a C major scale, and I'm going to show you how you can connect patterns by using position shifts. And I am going to throw in some inside the strings picking because you know, it's easier, it's, it's manageable when you're ascending, but all my descending uh, patterns are going to be done with outside the strings picking, and that's where you're going to see me shifting. So it goes like this. So just take that one measure at a time. We start out going. But yeah, instead of going to C, we're going to go to E here. But notice the slide. And then we're going to continue through the scale. Now you notice that I, I moved a note. It was a B note. I moved it over to here. And then another slide. Again, the B note, I played it here, but then played it here because it just helped out with the picking pattern. I went for the outside of the strings, picking on the way down. So, so picking up from the downbeat of bar four, we're here now. Shift. Shift. Notice I shifted, I played four notes with a pinky shift. Two notes, two notes, two notes, two notes, and then four notes again with the index finger shift. And then we're gonna bar five, I'm still in 10th position, take this next note, shift, another shift. And that's a shift right there because my goal was to continue that kind of like, I go up eight notes, come down eight notes, but then I, I start at a higher place. Okay, so shift, shift, and then bar seven. Notice I played the D note on the G string's 19th fret, then I moved it over to the 15th fret on the B string coming down. And then we finish up that first part in bar eight.
And then we have the descending four bars in, starting in bar nine. So it's either four notes or two notes per string, and you know you could try to continue that pattern. You know I would suggest taking these ideas and transposing them to different keys, and start small. You know, start with small little patterns, four note things, and then see how you can cleverly you know find a an opening, find a path where using a finger slide where you can just shift up to the next string and then try to increase your range up and down the neck. You know, that's um, a great way is to, to try to find little paths, you know, and be creative and experiment and you have to have like a troubleshooting type of mindset, you know, where you're not just kind of like doggedly try to do something It's hard thinking that if you do it enough times it'll come. That's true to a certain extent with certain things, but I find it's better to you know, find an alternate way, as long as you get the sound you want, right? That's all that matters. So, have fun with the stuff and good luck. See you soon.